In this video, we're going to discuss three micronutrients, choline, folate, and vitamin B12, and we're going to discuss the role in one-carbon metabolism. We're going to learn what the importance of one-carbon metabolism is for growth and for development. Then we're going to talk about what the critical roles of those micronutrients are, choline, folate, and cobalamin, as critical to the function of one-carbon metabolism. We're going to predict what would happen if one-carbon metabolism isn't sufficiently supplied, and we're going to discuss the genetic variation of a particular gene, MTHFR, that is critical for folate metabolism. Several reactions involve transferring of a methyl group from one chemical to the other. These methylation reactions are critical for cellular growth and development. There's a large number of targets of methylation, but this includes DNA and RNA, it includes development of both hair and nails and other organ systems, and it's critically important for both neuronal function and digestion. Shown here on the right is an example of a methylation reaction, where a cytosine is modified by methylation. In human reactions, methyl groups come from a chemical called S-adenylmethionine. This is a universal methyl donor for most methylation reactions. In this reaction, S-adenylmethionine, abbreviated as SAM, transfers its methyl group to a substrate, in this case a protein. As a result, we're left with S-adenosyl homocysteine, referred to as SAH. Every time you undergo a methylation reaction, you take the methyl group off a of SAM and you're left with a SAH. The substrates of this methylation can include DNA, histones, amino acids, and phospholipids. All of these are important for growth and development. In order to have a constant supply of SAM, you need to regenerate SAM from SA. This is done using something called the folate methionine cycle. A schematic of the folate methionine cycle is shown here. As you can see, every time you do a methylation reaction, SAM is converted into SA. This is then converted into homocysteine, and then back to methionine, and then into S-adenomethionine. So as long as you can reconvert homocysteine back into S-adenomethionine, you're going to have sufficient amounts of methyl groups for these methylation reactions. But if you can't recycle S-adenomethionine, and you don't have enough SAM for the methylation reactions, those methylation reactions will not be able to proceed effectively. But where do those methyl groups originally come from? Well, there's two major sources. One is from choline, which is converted into a chemical called betaine, and then onto methionine. So the methyl group from choline eventually gets transferred onto S-adenomethionine. The other source is a chemical called folate, also known as vitamin B9. It also goes through a similar cycle, where folate is methylated into 5-methyl-THF. 5-methyl-THF can as well add a methyl group onto homocysteine, resulting in methionine, and then eventually S-adenomethionine. So you can generate methyl groups by providing dietary provision of both choline and folate. In addition to requiring sufficient amounts of folate and choline for all the methylation reactions, there's several vitamins that are critical for the function of this cycle. For example, vitamin B6 and vitamin B2 are both important for folate conversion into 5-methyl-THF. Vitamin B12 is critical for the enzyme that converts betaine or 5-methyl-THF into methionine. So you need to have not only sufficient amounts of folate and choline to provide the methyl groups, but you also have to have sufficient amounts of vitamin B2, B6, and B12 for these reactions to proceed effectively. If there's a limitation in any of those factors, there'll be a limiting amount of s adenomethionine and methylation may not be able to proceed effectively. If we look at folate requirements, for example, across the lifespan, you can see that males and females require about the same amount of folate throughout their life. However, during pregnancy and lactation, the requirements of folate are much higher, 600 micrograms per day during pregnancy, 500 micrograms per day during lactation. That's because the mother needs to provide folate for both the building of the placenta, but then also for the building of the developing fetus. During lactation, the mother still needs to be able to supply its own folate requirements for growth, but then also the dramatic requirements of folate from birth to six months in the child, since they usually get that folate through the maternal milk. Folate deficiency is reasonably common. The average intake of folate in adult females is 455 micrograms per day, so just barely over the adequate intake. That means many people do not meet the adequate intake on a day-to-day -day basis. Since the intake requirement is higher during pregnancy, there's a high risk of deficiency in folate during pregnancy. So as such, folate is a very highly recommended prenatal supplement. One thing that's been noted with folate deficiency is it is associated with something called neural tube defects. This involves the improper closure of the neural tube during development, a process which requires substantial methylation products. This is one reason why folate is recommended as a prenatal supplement. Another reason somebody might be folate deficient is because alcohol interferes with dietary folate absorption. So people who are chronic alcoholics 
tend to have lower circulating levels of folate. In 1998, in the United States, folate has become part of our mandatory food fortification, which means that most people get sufficient folate from their general diet. In this time, since the institution of folate fortification, neural tube defects have been reduced dramatically, reduced by 28% since 1998. This is largely considered a public health success, as folate fortification has reduced a common deficiency associated with folate limitations. Another source of potential folate deficiency is genetic variation. The gene MTHFR, shown here at the bottom, has a common variant, and that variant is quite common in both Hispanic, white, and Asian populations. What this does is it reduces the ability for folate to be interconverted into 5-methyl-THF, the precursor for the recycling of homocysteine into S-adenomethionine. Therefore, if you have this loss of function variant in MTHFR, you may not have sufficient transfer of folate methyl groups into S-adenomethyl methyl groups. So just like a folate dietary restriction, you are at high risk of folate deficiency from a genetic basis. One carbon metabolism, the reactions by which methyl groups are added to various chemicals, are critical for proper growth and development. And this is dependent on the regeneration of S-adenomethionine through something called the folate methionine cycle. This is dependent on the supply of methyl groups from both folate and choline to regenerate SAM. Several vitamins are required for the folate methionine cycle to work properly, including vitamin B2, vitamin B12, and vitamin B6. There's also genetic differences, specifically in MTHFR, which can affect the regeneration of SAM from folate. Loss of this can result in neural tube defects and other phenotypes that are associated with loss of one carbon metabolism. Methylation is critical for development, and many chemical reactions require transfer of methyl groups from SAM into other substrates. Deficiencies in this can result in a large number of phenotypes, notably neural tube defects, but has also been associated with cardiovascular disease. Therefore, it's critical that we're able to identify and meet the choline and folate requirements to supply methyl groups to SAM so that methylation reactions can proceed unimpeded. This can vary between people due to their genetics, alcohol intake, and other micronutrient intakes that all have to work together to make the folate methionine cycle function effectively.